So Courtney um, is now an assistant professor at McGill and also part-time at Google, uh, but she has like a lot of Cornell connections. So it's great to have her here in the official colloquium. Um, so she was a PhD student of Dmitry Drusvatsky's, um, uh, yeah, Dima Drusvatsky, who was a PhD student of um, Adrian Lewis a couple of years back. And uh, well, if you ask Adrian, he was his advisor in the reverse direction than you would think. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, Courtney um, has some uh, uh, impressive sort of accolades, like one of them that uh, came out after her PhD was she won the NSF math postdoc. Um, and uh, uh, her recent work has been sort of going more towards the optimization in machine learning space, whereas the previous work, I guess you would say is more straight non-smooth optimization. Um, and this is a really cool new work that she has uh, on average case analysis in optimization. So take it away, Courtney. Ah, yeah. So uh, thank you for having me. Um, and also feel free to interrupt anytime you have questions. I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Um, yeah, so today I want to talk to you guys about average case complexity uh, in optimization. There it goes. Uh, and I have some great collaborators who I've been working with on this project. Um, so Fabian and Bart uh, were from Google Brain. And uh, I started working also with my husband, Elliot, who's now on this paper. <laughs> um, and then a graduate student, Kiwan, uh, we just started. Um, he, he did some contributions onto a paper that just got uh, put onto the archive today. So uh, in optimization, uh, we talk about complexity theory. What's the idea here? So we're, we're trying to minimize some function f of x. And we look at sort of the number of iterations until we reach some sort of optimality conditions, such as the gradient being less than epsilon. And traditionally, the way we measure complexity theory and optimization is done through worst case analysis. So this is Nesterov, Numerovsky stuff. And the idea with worst case is that we sort of can put a bound on, I mean, we can allow for any input and we bound the complexity based on any input. So we can put sort of the worst function value or the worst X naught into it. To start. And what's nice about it is that it guarantees convergence, right? You're, you're absolutely guaranteed that your algorithm was converged because you put in any input into it and you know it'll work. Now, what's uh, sort of a downside of doing this type of worst case analysis is that you, you can, it, it doesn't potentially give you the complexity that you might see in practice or the runtimes that you might actually see, typical runtimes that are observed. And the very classic example of this in optimization is the simplex method in LP, uh, which we know like in its worst case complexity is exponential, but actually, you know, for any sort of generic type problem, any problem that most people can give it, it's going to have a typical polynomial runtime. So it's very nice. So, so what do people tend to do? What's the sort of alternative to worst case analysis? Well, you could look at something like average case analysis. So what is average case? Average case is instead, we're going to take uh, an average over all the inputs. So we're not going to look at the worst function. We're going to sort of put a distribution on our inputs, so a distribution, say, on our functions in some way, and we compute the average complexity of that. And what is this supposed to be more representative of? Well, it's supposed to represent more your typical runtimes that you actually see. Uh, it, not only, I should say, you know, you get typical runtimes, but in average case complexity, uh, you also get more information. I would say like more statistics about it. You get the variance of your runtime. So you get more information when you do sort of this average case. Uh, it can also lead to say better bounds and better algorithms. So the, the classic, I would say, example of this type of leading to a better algorithm is quicksort from computer science. And so just to give you a picture of sort of what we mean and sort of what is the difference, between average versus worst case is you can imagine that you have sort of an input space into your into your optimization problem, uh, which is represented as sort of the x, y axis, I guess. And you take the run times of it and you know the worst case, if you have just even one input, which creates this big spike in runtime, your worst case is only going to measure that guy. Whereas you can see in general, the typical behavior is sort of this thing down below here. Oops. Oh, no. Okay, there you go. Uh, you can do this also with just running things like gradient descent. You can see sort of the worst case runtimes versus the average case. 
Okay. Now, despite sort of the benefits of doing average case complexity, it, it's hardly ever used in continuous optimization. Um, sort of the simplex method is, is kind of, I don't know, uh, there's a few others, but it, it hasn't really, you haven't really looked at it very much. Uh, and just to give some prior work on this, uh, you know, I talked about quick sort and simplex, so they're kind of the way they do it. Uh, simplex method, um, the way that they did the simplex method, they used something called smoothed analysis. I'm not doing smoothed analysis here. I'm, I'm actually going to do a, a, a completely average case uh, thing. Smoothed analysis is kind of an in-between sort of uh, uh, average versus uh, worst case. Uh, but where we actually got this problem from and what made us interested in this was from the numerical analysis uh, people. And these are people who were looking at, well, what is the typical runtime of things like QR? Or what's the typical runtime of doing an LU decomposition or finding the largest eigenvalue, those type of things. And what they observed was a, a concentration effect. And they were actually able to compute some average case complexities for those types of algorithms. And we saw this and we thought, you know, this, we could do this in optimization. This is, this is very reasonable. Um, and so this was done with uh, Percy Deff and uh, Tom Trogdon did a lot of work in this area in that numerical analysis group. So, so why is average case such a hard thing, at least for optimization problems? Um, and I, there's many things to, to talk about in terms of difficulty, but I, I listed three here. And the first one you have to do is you have to answer what does one mean by a typical problem in optimization? What is a typical convex problem? What is a typical strongly convex? You have to put some sort of distribution already on there. Um, another downside, which I think is actually really apparent, is that there's this belief that somehow because you have to put a, a distribution on your input, that the resulting complexity is highly dependent on the probability of the uh, probability distribution that you put on it. So it, it really depends, like there's this belief kind of that it, it depends on what input that you, you gave it, what type of distribution you gave it. And then you could always ask yourself sort of, does this thing actually coincide with any kind of empirical behavior? Like, do you actually really see this average case? Period. You should, but but do you actually see it? Um, and so the first question you have to do is you have to answer the, the first problem, which is what do you mean by a typical convex problem? So we're like, okay, if we want to do, do average case complexity, what should we look at? So we thought, let's do our easiest problem out there, or at least to us, our easiest problem, which is let's look at least squares. Let's do regression. Okay, so let's just look at the norm of AX minus B. And, and the reason for this is one, a lot of algorithms work for this, for this problem. And, and two is that it's, it's very clear now what one means by uh, the random inputs or what one means by the inputs here, right? Once you least, get down to a least squares problem, it's clear that your inputs are going to be sort of the data matrix A and the vector B. Okay. And so you can then Start and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what I mean by random here. But then you can say, okay, what what is the number of iterations in order to make the gradient less than epsilon, the halting time, which is what I'm going to call. And and so we did this, and we we just started by running an experiment. And what we observed was the following picture, which we thought was really cool, um, and we hadn't seen before. And so what this idea was, uh, we ran gradient descent on this least squares problem. And we computed the number of iterations until the gradient was less than epsilon. And what we did is we varied the size of the, the matrix A, of this random matrix A. So the, the x-axis here is different uh, uh, sizes of the matrix, this random matrix A. And we generated the entries of A from various distributions. So we generated it from a Gaussian distribution or Bernoulli or a student T distribution. And for each, matrix A, we ran gradient descent. And for each dimension, we ran about 16,000. Actually, we did this on Google, which is the only reason you can run 16,000 uh, uh, least squares problems without someone complaining to you. But actually, Google eventually complained too. They're like, you're just running least squares. But you can do it, and, and you can compute the halting time. And so on the y-axis is this halting time. And you, what you see here is that as you increase the dimension, as you increase the size of this random matrix, all of these 
different randomness, matrices, how they were distributed, all converge to the exact same value for the halting time. And so you get this universality result that it didn't really depend, that the halting time somehow doesn't depend on the distribution of your input, that they're all converging to the same exact value. Um, and, and it's predictable. This value is it's, it's converging to one value. It's not converging to some sort of distribution. Uh, yeah, Damic, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, so uh, just to get a sense, like how are you choosing your epsilon in this figure? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, we just fixed the epsilon to be like 10. I, I forget if we made it 10 to the minus six or eight, I think when we did this. Um, yeah, uh, there is, a, I should point out, there are some numerical errors, like numer just numerical calculation errors when you do these for lots of things for the student T. Um, you get some weird results just because of numerical problems with multiplication. So that's why the student T is a little bumpy. Um, yeah, there's another question. Sorry, uh, Ling Zhou? Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> how do you choose like the the n, like the 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 number of uh, rows? Like, did you fix it? Or? That's a good question. So <laughs> the n and d. So what I, I'll I'll explain this in a second. We what you do is you actually fix the ratio. So you fix the ratio of d over n. So it's the number of parameters over over the number of uh, samples. So I'm going to fix that to be a, a constant and then just let n get large. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and you'll see the effect of how that ratio matters. So that value is a good question. Uh, yeah. Any others? Sorry. I get everyone. Make sure I can see everyone. Okay. Ah, none. Can I move it? No. Uh oh. Sorry. It doesn't let me. Okay, I'm just going to go down a second up here. So this leads to the question of how do we actually generate our, our matrices A and B, uh, our vector B. So the idea that we used here is a generative model. So we took a random matrix A and we generated our B by taking a signal. So we AX tilde is like our signal. And then we added some noise to it. So sort of the generative model. So we took a random signal here. And you can, uh, you don't need this to be random, but I'm assuming that I'm initializing also randomly. It, it doesn't actually need to be in there, but it's easier if I just say everything's random than confuse people. Um, and then the other assumption that we made is uh, we did this because we, we thought this was the most realistic setting, is we made it so that the signal to noise ratio is constant. So because we're increasing dimensions, so we're going to be looking at things which are in large N and large D here. So as we vary N and D, we need to make sure that the, the amount of signal and the amount of noise in B was the same. And that's an assumption, a modeling assumption we made. You can not put that in, but if you don't put it in, then you're either going to make the signal become more heavy as you increase dimension, or you're going to make the noise become more heavy as you increase dimension. So you need some something there. Uh, to do it. It just depends. It, and the model will work in, in either case. Okay. So what are examples of how you can generate this, uh, these random matrices A? So one way is you can, the classic sort of random matrix theory way, uh, is that you look at the entries of A and you make them IID. And you make them mean zero with some fixed standard deviation and they have finite moments. So notice here, this has nothing to do, there's no assumption on the distribution itself. You just need a mean zero fixed standard deviation and finite moment distribution. So that's what we call the isotropic features. Ah, okay, I can't do that button. The second one that we also like to add is something called the uh, one hidden layer neural networks. So the idea with this is you look at the entries of AIJ by taking it as a um, composing it with an activation function and multiplying it by two random matrices, W and Y. And so you, you still get a least squares problem. Now by replacing uh, the A with sort of the G of W, Y, X minus B. And, and where this comes up is that you can think of, of this problem as you have random weights as your first layer and you're just minimizing in your neural network the very last layer. Um, this is used a little bit in kernel methods, it came up 
with Ben Recht. Um, it's been used in generalization theory for, for neural networks also. Uh, it's also called random features if you, if you heard of this before. So we have two of these. So really, what do we actually need to assume about our random matrix? Well, if you look at the, since we're doing least squares, if you look at the Hessian of the least squares problem, it has the form A transpose A. So everything here is going to be determined by A transpose A. Okay, so that's what I'm calling H. And, and this is the question that someone else had about my assumptions on the size is that I'm going to assume that the ratio of your parameters, D, divided by your number of samples, N, is converging to some fixed R. So I, I'm fixing sort of the ratio or rather of the matrix itself. Um, and then what's going to matter the most about all this, as you can imagine in optimization algorithms, is the eigenvalue distribution. So I'm going to assume that the empirical eigenvalue distribution of H converges to a compactly supported measure. Okay, so basically all this means is that I have some distribution of eigenvalues for this H. And the last thing is, I, uh, and these can be relaxed a little bit, is that I need something about the largest and smallest eigenvalue. And this is because these appear in our algorithms. They're used in step size selection. So I just need that the largest eigenvalue converges sort of to the largest value of my mu, and the smallest eigenvalue converges to the smallest value of my mu. Um, and you don't actually need the last one. That's only if the algorithm uses it. Um, yeah, Damon. So I guess maybe quick question that I might have is, um, are there natural sufficient assumptions that guarantee the empirical measure converges to a compact measure? Yeah. Um, so almost all random matrix theory ones have this compactly supported measure. Um, like the ones that you generate normally have some sort of compactly supported uh, a measure associated with it. Uh, basically, random matrix theory is all about proving how, how eigen or entries of H uh, yield these measures and write down what these measures are. Um, so just maybe I can ask one more. Um, so what if like, uh, let's just say the matrix has bounded entries that are mean zero. And, bounded. and also you have like index you know, full rank and with probability one, as long as you take enough measure, um, dimension, something like that. like. Yeah, so I, I mean, if they're IID, then they'll satisfy the isotropic type conditions, right? As long as you have, because everything there. So so that will fall under one, the isotropic grouping. Um, right. Uh, yeah, uh, but there's other ones too. Um, you can actually just fix the, another way of seeing this, you can actually fix the, the spectrum and construct a random matrix from that, that has that spectrum. So you can always do that to get any, any spectrum out of it. And then it, but, one last oh, question, in yeah. terms of like heterotails, so this converges in probably, the measures converge, the empirical measures converge. Um, I, I don't really have a good sense personally of like, you know, what happens with heavy tails. Um, how much does a heavy tail really influence the distribution of the, or the size of the support? Yeah, um, it, it, it will affect it. So so at least, okay, for the isotropic features, you can't have too, too heavy. It, think of these things as um, law of large numbers results. So so these, these empirical spectrums um, convergence results are, if you want to do it from a random matrix, like what entries convert, give you these, uh, these compactly supported measures, um, they're really law of large numbers type statements. There or or um, or central limit theorem statements in the sense that if you look at what the conditions on isotropic features are, they're exactly the conditions that you have in some sense for law of large numbers to hold. Uh, <laughs> now, this all being said, our thing will work if like if you a priori put that that spectrum on your matrix H, like you you force the H to have those that distribution of eigenvalues. So whatever distribution that gives you your t heavy tails, if you have some sort of convergence in its eigenvalues, you can force it and that's all you need. Um, that makes sense. Uh, but that actually leads to a good question. I mean, leads to a good example here of the Marchinko Pasteur. So, so what, what are these sort of measures look like? An example of this is a, a in the isotropic features, it converges, we know from random matrix theory, 
its eigenvalues converge to the Marchinko pester. And so this is an example, this is a distribution, this is what the Marchinko pester looks like. Um, and you could write down a beautiful formula for the, the eigenvalues, it's compactly supported and everything. And you can see how the effect of R, so R is this ratio of the model size over the number of samples has on it. Um, and if you're a mathematical physicist, because <laughs> that's where a lot of these random matrix theory results came from, the Marchinko pester is like the Gaussian distribution for eigenvalues. It appears everywhere. So if you want to study anything about eigenvalues, you have to you have to do something about Marchinko pester because it's going to appear. And actually, we see this. So uh, this was done by Mahoney, and they were actually doing it on real data and using neural networks. And they actually saw Marchinko pester start to appear in, in, the, in their distribution for the weight matrices. So these are on the weight. So when you, when you go through training of these neural networks, uh, the, you can compute the, the distribution of the eigenvalues for the weights of your matrix, and uh, you see Marchinko pester. So they fit the Marchinko pester. Now, they also observed that there are like this sort of extra things, um, these sort of outliers or even power laws appearing. Um, and those are things that we want to explore, but we, we kind of were like, okay, at least Marchinko Pasteur is appearing, and, and maybe we'll stick with that at least for a little while to, to prove some results. Um, but it does appear. So if Marchinko Pasteur is, like I said, it's the Gaussian of everything. It's the thing that you have to do first. So the question for us is how do we actually show uh, this this sort of uh, a funny halting time result, uh, this universality. And the idea actually came from old school optimization, which said, hey, every first order method there's on a least squares problem has an associated polynomial uh, in the matrix H. Um, this is a known result, it's iterative methods. Uh, it's pretty, it comes from like a CG idea. And just to give you an example of this, you can see this in gradient descent. So in gradient descent, you take xk, it's equal to xk minus uh, 1 over L times the gradient. You just plug in what the gradient is, and you iterate the procedure down, all the way down to x0 minus x tilde, and you get some polynomial. So in the case of gradient descent, it's very easy. The polynomial looks like something like i minus h to the k. Okay. But like I said, you can do this with any first order method. And we did this, and it was kind of fun, actually. Uh, so we did this with other algorithms like Nestorov's convex, which, by the way, there's actually a closed form for the polynomials. It's uh, the difference of Legendre polynomials. Um, you can do this with Polyak method, momentum, um, Nestorov and the Stranley convex. Um, you can just write down what the, these polynomials are actually equal to. Now, all these polynomials have something in common, which I should mention. And I think it's by design. I don't know if it was intentional. But they all have it so that if you look at near their smallest eigenvalue, there's a big peak. And if you look at what happens at their largest eigenvalue, at the largest eigenvalue, it decreases. It's, it gets really small. So most of the behavior, most of the mass underneath these polynomials are it's all concentrated around the smallest eigenvalue. Right? Uh, uh, that's a result of this. They kind of kill off the largest eigenvalue as you let k get bigger and bigger. Oops, uh, I keep hitting the wrong button, sorry. Uh, you can graph these and they're kind of fun to graph. Um, so you can see I just graphed the, the first like thousand polynomials of each of these and you can see their different behaviors. Uh, in the case of Nesterov's poly Nesterov's convex one, which is the bottom one, it's actually closer to a Bessel function, so it actually has behavior. But you can see that there's like this kind of push towards the small end, the small near zero. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Damik. Oh, I just had a quick question. I'm not sure I understood the statement about like where the eigenvalues are. Uh, you, you seem to say that they these polynomials emphasize the smaller eigenvalues. Is yeah. That, how do I how do I understand that? I, I think I might have missed that. Sorry, sorry about that. Yeah. So the idea is that uh, this H, uh, it, um, it's a polynomial in H. So then it just becomes a polynomial in the eigenvalues of H, uh, is what matters. And so you can think of it as a one-dimensional polynomial now. And so uh, if you think of it as p of lambda, then what I mean by the mass near near the smallest eigenvalue is that when 
most of the mass of the polynomial is near zero. So when lambda is equal to zero, there, most of your polynomials have this sort of, you see a lot of the behaviors all along uh, near the zero uh, term. These are very small. Once you go out far enough, when lambda gets really large, it, it's zero. Um, it just, it looks like zero. You won't see anything else about those polynomials. Cool. Thanks. So how do you actually start to analyze all of this? Um, it's really cool. Uh, the basic idea is very simple and what you show. The intuition is that the gradient of S is basically a trace in this polynomial of H. That's what you actually can show. Um, that's a really cool, nice result. And once you know it's just a trace of the polynomial in H, well, it means that the gradient is really just controlled by the eigenvalues of H because a trace and you have polynomial, you're back to eigenvalue, okay? And so now this is where the random matrix theory starts to, to play its role because if you have a random H, then you, uh, you know stuff about its empirical eigenvalue distribution and you have this universal distribution. So you, you get this universality result for free just from random matrix theory and by noticing that the gradient is somehow only involving its eigenvalues of this H. And that led us to this concentration of the gradient. And we thought this was really cool. So what we showed is that the gradient converges, uh, concentrates to this value, uh, to this integral. And this integral has everything in it. It has all the information that you have ever wanted. It has how the algorithm behaves, how the algorithm affects the, gra the, con the, the convergence of the gradient through the polynomial P, okay? You see exactly, you see how the signal in changes the, the convergence rate. And you also see the eigenvalues. The eigenvalues are being controlled by this D mu. That's the measure of your eigenvalues, your distribution. Um, and now you can start to understand why I was talking about that there's a lot of mass of these polynomials near zero. Well, because if there's a lot of mass near zero, this integral is basically being controlled by what happens near zero, uh, because most of your mass of your polynomials, the wildness is around that zero. Yeah, there's a question, sorry. Uh, uh, by the way, I might not be able to see everyone, so <laughs> please interrupt me if I miss you guys. I uh, only have like six of you on my screen, so <laughs> um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. just a quick question regarding, uh, so do you make any assumption on the initial vector X node and what, what is, like, how this is related to the noise or? Uh, yeah. That's a good question. Um, so uh, when we originally did, we assumed that the expectation of the, basically the expectation of the norm of X zero minus X tilde was equal to zero. Uh, and then you can actually relax that um, if you have more randomness in your matrix. So if you're using isotropic features, you, you basically don't need to assume anything about X zero and X tilde. Uh, the noise you need, to be independent and have mean zero, um, but but the the x the initial and the x signal are, can be can be anything. Uh, the only thing you you do need is that because you're increasing things in dimension, you need that they all have that the norm of x zero minus x tilde is is some fixed constant. Because you know if you increase dimension, you also could increase the size. You could start further and further away, and x zero minus x tilde is it's fixed, or is it about upper bounded by a constant? Uh, it's fixed. I made it fixed um, because I don't want to do any bounds. So okay. I'm gonna, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, but this is really cool. I, I hope everyone, I don't know, when I first saw this, I thought this was really cool because you can actually see explicitly how eigenvalues affect convergence rates. Uh, it's not just the largest and smallest eigenvalue that we were taught. You see how the whole spectrum actually contributes, particularly how the spectrum near zero is contributing to the complexity. Um, and that's the key important part about all of this. Um, and from that, you, you can get average case ideas. You can get this halting time concentration. And the reason why you can get this halting time is because this integral is essentially your average. That's your essentially what your average gradient is going to be. And so you can define the halting time, the first time that the gradient is smaller than epsilon. And you can talk about the equivalent of, well, when's the first time, it's not a random, but first time that the, this constant is less than epsilon, and you can show that these two things are the same in probability going to one, okay? And I should also mention that although these things are all done in like where I take N and D very, very large, 
you don't actually need it. Like you will see this behavior much, much sooner than when N and D is large. Like it actually occurs in finite dimension. Yeah. Go ahead. So here you have, uh, sorry, yeah. So here you have an, a limit um, over D for fixed epsilon that these two are the same. Do you have any control over how quickly they become the same? It's a good question. Um, it, it looks like I didn't do it. Uh, I didn't uh, prove it, but empirically, it's definitely like d to the one half standard deviation. It converges. It's a standard standard uh, variance for for random matrices that you see. Um, I didn't prove it. I, I think you can just get it directly from random matrix theory stuff. But I, um, without doing too much work, I just didn't do it. Um, it it's a good question, um, and you can do this. So this. Lee squares, you can see this. Uh, Nestor up, you can see these results happening. Um, I plotted sort of the distribution of the actual halting times. You can see that it, it looks log normal at first, basically has a log normal behavior, and then gradually goes to, to uh, normal as you make n get large. And as I was mentioning, it, it kind of the concentration occurs at like a d to the one half behavior. Um, it works beyond least squared. Uh, we did it for logistic regression. You see it there. Also, you see it for SGD. Um, it's pretty cool. It seems like it actually, you see this concentration effect, even for things which are not, not um, least squares type problems. So this led us to average case complexity. So I just want to make a mention of, uh, again, what I'm going to do the average cases. I'm just going to fix that I'm working in the isotropic features model. So here I'm going to assume my measure is Marchinko Pester. And with Marchinko Pester uh, distributions, it has this unique uh, idea here, which is that as, as R goes to one, so as the model size over the number of samples goes to one, um, the gap between the smallest eigenvalue and zero disappears. Okay, so as R goes to one, the gap between the smallest eigenvalue and, and zero disappears. So what this means is that when R is equal to one, you have eigenvalues which are really, really close to zero, like sufficiently close to zero, which essentially means that you should expect different convergence behaviors in the case when R is equal to one and R not equal to one. So when R is not equal to one or bounded away from one, you have this gap and you sort of expect sort of like a strongly convex behavior for your algorithm. And when R is actually equal to one, you, you're basically looking at things near zero. Like you have eigenvalues which are zero and they're going to control everything. So we expect it and we see this. So if you run uh, a gradient descent on this least squares problem and you vary the R, so I varied the R on the X axis and you computed the halting time, you can really see that when R is equal to one, that you get this huge spike in the, in the number of, number of uh, uh, iterations, it's, it's gigantic. And this is super reminiscent of generalization properties, which are, which show the double descent. This is also a double descent type behavior. Um, people actually use this R for, for the double descent. Um, they as a capacity measurement. And I'm happy to talk about that. It's, it's sort of a side product of, of all of this. Uh, but you really do see that you get different convergence behaviors when R is equal to one and not equal to one um, in this spike. Okay, so how do you actually compute all these average cases? Well, all you have to do is, you know, you, we have the polynomials. All you have to do is put in the measure being the Marchinko Pester, which we happen to know everything about. So you can just compute what this right hand side, what these integrals are. And that's all. And, and you can do that. And uh, it's pretty cool. Um, I, I do want to point out uh, one thing, <laughs> which is how do you do worst case complexity? So the way we, we measured worst case is we took the upper bound, you know, that you get from the worst case value and we use that. It, um, so, so that's what I, I did here. And you can actually plot the difference between the worst case and the average case sort of the ratio and see how far off sort of the average case is to the worst case value uh, that you get. And you, you see that the worst case are like not representative of anything related to what you actually exhibit, at least under these modeling assumptions. Um, they're pretty far, far removed. This is the distribution. You get a huge difference. Um, the other thing to note is that our average cases really do match up. So in the top graph here, we ran a gradient descent with R is equal to one, like 8,000 times and there's there's literally 8,000 runs on this. There's no difference. It's concentrated. And this is actually with n is equal to 1,000. So it, it really is our rates are, are pretty close to what you actually exhibit. 
Um, and you can compute. So we computed all these average cases, worst case for all these different methods. Uh, you can ignore the adversarial I was doing. There's another model in my paper and I, I left it in here. But you do get better. So you get orders uh, for the, the convex setting, you actually see improvement in the overall rate. Uh, you get orders of magnitude. So for Nesterov, you see something like k cubed and you end up with k to the fourth. So you get an order of, of a k factor faster. It's quite significant. Um, same thing with gradient descent. Um, in, the con in the strongly convex case, you don't see these types of, of huge improvements in the rates because almost everything is linear and the linear rate still, still is the same. The, the main difference is that you, you do get this extra polynomial factor. Um, that appears. Uh, and that polynomial factor actually is, it explains why you get better rates in the convex setting. <laughs> because as R goes to one, okay, in the, in the strongly convex, that polynomial is not really going to matter. But as R goes to one, that polynomial rate starts to, it starts to impact the, the sublinear rate. And that's why you get actually better improvements in the convex. So this is like getting a second order effect. You get not just the linear rate, but you also get the polynomial rate. Um, cool. By the way, maybe I should stop. Is there any questions on that? Or is that? I hope. I really like this. I think it's a really cool idea. So <laughs> I love to hear people's feedback on it. I think uh, um, I think <laughs> there's a lot of things you can do with this. Um, it's a different way of looking at um, complexity. Yeah. Go ahead, Damick. Just just a quick question about can we can we look at your table on the sublinear <laughs> rates? Yeah. Um, so this is really interesting. So you improve upon um, sort of the optimal convex methods for this problem um, yeah. by the power of k, or basically one over k. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. By the way, this, for the, oh, okay. okay. I was yeah. confused about the one over k cube for a second, but then I remember <laughs> measuring. Gradient. Yeah, I'm measuring gradient. Sorry, I'm gradient squared. You can, by the way, you can do this all for function values and iterates. I just I didn't do it because, it, well, gradients is the natural stopping criteria, so it made it easier for us to compute halting times. But uh, you can definitely do it for function values as well. Um, I just didn't do it in this. In this, it's a very good question. Um, yeah. By the by the way, I, these are not the best. Nesterov, I, I think you can prove that you can actually get a better average case <laughs> than Nesterov. Um, <laughs> Uh, just for a more orthogonal polynomial theory, but but that's another another topic, I guess, um, to discuss about this. Um, so then, what we decided was we we're like, this is really cool. Let's try and do this for SGD. Um, SGD, right? Uh, we can think of uh, least squares problem in terms of sort of a large finite sum, right? Because it's just the sum of a i x minus b i squared summed up. So this is still the least squares problem. So I'm still going to assume this sort of generative model. And what am I going to do with SGD? So I just pick sort of uh, FI, one of these AIs, uh, uh, indices at, at random, and I just do an update. Um, now this is, is a much harder algorithm to analyze, not only now because you have randomness in B and A, but you also have randomness in the algorithm itself. So it's not like you're re repeating the same matrix over and over again. Now you have products of random matrices starting to appear and they're not the same and they can actually repeat itself, right? I'm allowing for multiple passes over the data. So you could actually get the same uh, I twice in a row. Okay. And so the question that we had, just like we had sort of in the other one, is kind of how do we make these good quantitative predictions for, for stochastic algorithms? And, and this is particularly important for these, these types of algorithms because uh, understanding these predictions can has an impact on sort of these generalization theories, um, step size selection for these algorithms is much less known. How does momentum start to play a role? Uh, even typical runtime behaviors. It's not really well known for stochastic algorithms. We, we always measure everything in terms of expectation. Oops, uh, wrong direction. Okay. So there's been a lot of work in this. Uh, most people do a model of SGD. So they either use something like a stochastic differential equation uh, to model the SGD. So they assume that it, their, their update for, for the, the gradient to, or for the iterate is given by the gradient plus um, some Brownian noise. Um, 
and then they impose some sort of covariance on on the on the Brownian motion part of it. Either they just assume it's sort of isotropic, or if you actually want to make the behavior of SGD start to appear, you need to impose a covariance which matches the covariance of your stochastic gradients. Um, these are great, but the problem I think with SDEs is that they're super hard to analyze and they require your step size to go to zero, which is okay, but in general practice, you're, you're not going to send your step size to zero. So uh, they're, they're okay, but they're, they're just as hard to analyze in some ways as the original uh, SGD. Um, the other pe place people use in the model is streaming or one pass, where they don't repeat uh, over data sets. But, you know, usually these problems are done on finite data sets and you're going to pass over a couple of times. So it's it's not a great model for it. Ah, sorry, I keep hitting. Okay, I got to remember to hit this button. So our idea, again, was that we're going to look at this large end limit. So to get around having to send step sizes to zero and all sorts of things, we just wanted to look at uh, at the the this random matrix type approach. And so we don't really need a model. And what we showed is something super cool. I hope I have a little bit of time. Um, what we showed is that SGD, that the dynamics, the function values, converge in probability to not to a Volterra equation, not an ODE, a Volterra equation. And this Volterra equation is actually very special. It's a convolution type Volterra equation. So it's actually pretty well am, analyzed. We know what happens to it. Um, so that was pretty cool. And so I just wanted to explain what goes into this Volterra. This Volterra has two terms. So the first term is this gradient flow. And this gradient flow is kind of like what you expect in gradient descent. It has the same behavior as gradient descent. And what you can imagine is that this gradient flow is like sand, your, your sand, and it's flowing down some, some hole, and the hole that is flowing down is proportional to the size of the eigenvalue of H, okay? So you have all these holes corresponding to the eigenvalue of H, and you have sand flowing through. That's what gradient descent looks like, and, and that part of the gradient flow, it goes down like that. The second term is unique to SGD. The second term is a mixing term. So the second term is when your toddler gets into the sandbox and starts to throw around the sand all over the place. It starts moving, like messing up the sand. It's always harmful, but like, sorry, this is by the way, Nicholas LaRue's kid, my, my boss at Google's kid. So he's throwing around sand, right? It's, okay, and this is that mixing term. This is actually what this mixing term does. And basically for a little while, throwing around sand is totally fine. But eventually if you throw too much sand, you're not gonna converge. Like it's not, there's no sand going to flow through. And that's basically what you see. Now this mixing part, this throwing of the sand up in the air is actually, it's, it has a, a it's controlled by gamma squared, where gamma is the step size, gamma squared times uh, the, the size of the eigenvalue. So gradient flow, the whole, the sand is flowing through as something proportional to something like gamma times, times the eigenvalue, but you get a gamma squared of the mixing term. So you see that there's going to be some weird properties happening here. There's going to be some, some balancing going on between this gradient flow and this mixing term. Uh, oh gosh, sorry. I really need to not hit this button. I don't know what's causing it. So what do you, how do you actually do this? Well, because it's a Volterra equation of convolution type, turns out this is a renewal equation, super well studied. So what do you do? You pull out Resnick's book on stochastic processes and you can analyze this equation just straight up from a book. It's actually amazing. And what you can show is from this is that there's this critical step size and this critical step size corresponds to this idea again that like there's sand flowing and then there's a mixing and eventually the mixing is going to start to matter. Um, it starts to actually affect your, your convergence behavior. And that's what this critical step size. So there's this critical step size where when you're below it, when your step size is smaller than this critical value, you just have gradient flow. It's just like your sand is going down just like gradient flow, that the mixing term is not a, really having any big effect on it. And that's what you see in this picture. So on the x-axis is the, the step size, and on the y-axis is the convergence rates. And you can see for various r's that you have sort of this like linear, just straight down convergence, okay? And that's because it freezes at the smallest eigenvalue. <laughs> it just depends on the smallest eigenvalue. 
And then what happens is that if you cross this critical step size, which is this gray line, then you get a totally different behavior for SGD. Then the step size starts to impact the convergence rates because the mixing term starts to matter more and it impacts it in, in a nonlinear way. And you jump, you go from something which is frozen at the smallest eigenvalue to something which is wild. And that's what you end up with on that side. Um, so you see this behavior and you also can see from this that the optimal step size is always taken to be a little bit larger than the critical one, but the critical one is a pretty good, good value for, for uh, uh, the optimum. Um, and once you end with this, you can actually compute complexity results. Uh, again, you can just use ResNIC and you can compute asymptotic convergence rates um, and get from all from all the Voltaire equation. Um, it's pretty cool. You see this freezing effect. I, it, it actually is very reminiscent of, of like freezing transition behaviors in like uh, physics where you have ice it's like frozen and then all of a sudden it like melts and it becomes like liquid there's like this big jump it's the same sort of effect here um, and if you do this with the isotropic features you can you can actually compute everything so if you make your measure be this marchinko pastor you you can actually write down what gamma star it's exactly all the behavior what this the rates what the change is between the two different dynamics everything can be written down. So that's pretty cool. So, so you can actually write everything down and you can compute complexity <laughs> results, average case rates from that because once you have all that information, you can actually compute it and, uh, and you can write them all down. <laughs> and uh, it depends on gamma star, it depends on your step size being larger or smaller than gamma star that you get these two different dynamics. Uh, but you can write everything down and you get improvement just like you would uh, in um, just like you did in the previous case. I think the main difference in the SGD is that your rates are just always better. So even in the strongly convex setting, your complexity rate is actually always better than what you would get in the worst case. Even the linear rate is better. Um, it's just uh, the SGD convergence rates were really, really bad uh, that we gave, we have, they're just not, they're not good. Um, and here you can really, really see the improvement. And we did simulations of all of this. And so we ran, uh, you know, the SME model, we ran the stochastic, uh, sort of a simple stochastic differential equation model. We ran SGD, we ran a streaming, and then we ran our Volterra. And our Volterra was always accurate across various step sizes, across our values. It was like exactly matched the behavior of SGD. Um, and this was not even for very large n, right? This was for like n is equal to a thousand. It was just like completely perfect. Uh, we were amazed. It, it was really cool, um, really interesting. <laughs> Um, results. Whereas things like uh, SMEs, uh, so this is the stochastic differential equations, they really only match when you have very small step sizes. Um, and then I just want to end with sort of what we've showed um, and some conclusions. So uh, I think this stuff is really cool because you get a general framework for, for analyzing these methods uh, that gives you sort of average case complexity. Uh, it gives you, allows you to do stochastic algorithms now. Um, you see these sort of step size and phase transition behaviors that you, you don't see in gradient descent and deterministic. You don't, we've, I've never seen them in, in the works that people have done on SGD. Um, for work in progress, we're definitely looking at SGD with momentum because no one knows how to choose momentum parameters. Um, at all in stochastic methods. This might be a way to actually choose it. It should be should be reasonable to choose it. Um, doing sort of this uh, one hidden layer of neural network, understanding the effect of G, so the activation function is something I'm definitely interested in and been working on. Um, but I think for open problems, it's a lot. Uh, one of the big ones is you can start to change your ensembles. So you can start to change how you do A and B, relationship between A and B. Uh, you can start to look at non-convex functions. Um, and you can also start to do sort of other algorithms, like maybe like uh, some from signal processing where you have sort of the norm of, of AX minus B squared plus an L1, for instance. So you can do subgradient methods and things like that. Um, I think are actually pretty well doable in, in this in this context. So um, I'm very excited. So sorry if I ran over time. I, 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 
I like this a lot. Um, and uh, these are the two papers. The, the second one literally was posted today. I tried to get it out today for you guys. Um, yeah, and I guess I have a question. So thank you very much for having me. Um, and uh, Katja. Hey, Chris. I, Chris, let's let's thank you for okay. being uh, <laughs> Thanks. Sorry if I ran over. I tried. <laughs> no, no, you, you did a good job. You were, you were slightly under time. Oh, good. So, okay. Katya? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there was, uh, yeah, indeed, it was fast. Sorry, I raised my hand because I just uh, thought I'd jump in. I didn't you know, mean to push it so much. Uh, so, yeah, you were talking about, you know, various other things um, that you can do. But um, so the, the, the observation of the convergence of the eigenspectrum, right, comes from the fact that you're using the same matrix and then uh, expand uh, the, the size of the matrix. But uh, the question is, yeah, how much, so when you write gradient descent on a nonlinear uh, function, your Hessian changes, but, but not very fast, right? Yeah. So I, I'm curious, like, you know, did you try it? Like, I don't know, take logistic regression or something and have some random data. And did you try it and see what happens with the halting time at that point? Like just the halting time. Yeah, so we did logistic, but I, I mean, so logistic has the same type of property. I mean, I didn't, I didn't plot the I, uh, spectrum, but logistic does have this concentration. So this is a this oh, is done with logistic. Um, okay. But also, I mean, you bring up a good point, which we didn't do, and but has been done by other people. So like Mahoney and stuff has. I mean, it is a question: Can you run this on a neural network and, and with real data and, and see? what type of spectrum starts to appear? Does it exhibit this? We did a little bit with just like a two layer neural network. Um, Cause there you have activation functions start to affect things too, uh, which changes spectrum and they feed into each other. Uh, but um, it, it looks promising. I, I have to admit like, um, like, Marchinko Pasteur appears. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, so, it's a real phenomenon. And so, so so that's true. I mean, people do talk about how eigenvalues, uh, well, I mean, it, it, here you're looking at uh, the positive semi-definite matrix anyway, right? But yeah. for neural networks, it's not. But but there, there is this uh, observation that you have a very few, very large eigenvalues, right? Uh, and then uh, maybe a couple of negative eigenvalues and then everything is zero. But that's not the same thing as this Marchenko Pastor, I guess. Yeah, it's not exactly. Um, I think that's what something that Mahoney was trying to push in this paper, but that if you if you actually plot it against the Marchenko Pastor, it does have a behavior. It looks like Marchenko Pastor. Like they plotted the eigenvalues and tried to see how what the what the distribution of them actually is. And they they were basically like it, it it's got a lot of Marchenko Pastor. Um, but it, that's not surprising. Like, like mm -hmm. Like you, you should expect some of that be, just because it is like a Gaussian. It's like the Gaussian. So like physicists will tell you it, everything basically looks like Marchinko Pasteur, no matter what you do, like you're going to see it. Um, and random matrix theory people, I mean, they also, but they, they've been doing these sort of, uh, maybe if I go back, um, they've been looking at these one hidden layer neural networks and you, you do these activation functions, you can actually kind of write down what the, the density of the eigenvalues when you do these activation functions and how, how the activation function actually affects. It has a lot of the characteristics of a Marchinko Pasteur, it's just not exactly it. What I mean by characteristics of it, I mean that if you look at sort of the behavior near zero, the, the behavior of the density near, near the smallest eigenvalues, it, it looks like Marchinko Pasteur. So, and if your if your algorithm only cares about those anyway, that that's all you're going to see, <laughs> in some way. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, back back to logistic regression because I can okay. understand this a lot better. So, Sorry. This, so, no, no, it's fine. I mean, so in logistic regression, like you 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 can assume that randomness is naturally coming from the data, right? Uh, so the, that randomness is kind of very believable, and you're observing that the um, the halting time converges, but your theory is still for uh, least squares, right? That's correct. So, yeah. uh, right. So, so that that's what I'm I'm kind of trying to understand. So, like, you know, because essentially, 
you know, you, what you care about is is converging to the, I mean, you, you, you're you converging somewhere. It's the final Hessian and the final solution that may be somehow fixed anyway. And then once you're close to it, it's not that different. So it's not that different from the squares, except for, you know, things change a little bit. So do you see how the theory might extend or not? Uh, I see how it can extend. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, the, the, that's also my intuition that basically everything is roughly quadratic. So you're basically, I mean, if you can solve the quadratic problem, you're essentially solving every all convex problems in some ways. Um, but you're right, there's some, there's some differences. And I think a, a logistic might not be the best one to show this, but the, um, but like neural networks, right? Because there is like when initial training of the neural network, so initial iterates have very mm -hmm. different Hessians in final than the Hessians at the end of training. So like there is movement in the Hessians for neural networks. Um, so that might be interesting to explore more. Um, the other thing I think, which is super interesting, and I didn't talk about this, but I guess there's a lot of people who, who probably do LPs. I think LPs have a different behavior. And I do think you could do a type of framework for LPs with this, where you take A and B random, but I think there's more structure between A and B. Um, and so that, that like, you know, you might have more sparsity, for instance, in there, um, in these matrices that are used in the LP algorithm. Um, and that's something that I would like to look at. I just, I, I'm not an expert in LPs. So you kind of almost need to know kind of what, what are the natural, natural like conditions on A and B that, that appear. In neural networks, it seems like this is more the natural way. Like you have A and B and there's there's some dependence between A and B, but it's not it's not a lot. Like uh, it's just given by this very simple generative A, A, A X. They're kind of independent in some ways. Um, but I don't think that's true in LPs. Like I think LPs have like, <laughs> LPs are, have a much more different structure. I, I, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe someone with LP knowledge can speak up. <laughs> um, but but I think so. Uh, but you're right. I, I do think that there's a way to extend it, at least for certain ones. Like logistic, for sure, I think can be extended. Um, it's more just time at the, at the moment. I, I get to, I've get been picking and choosing the problems that I want to do in this area. I'm actually looking for more people to help me so I don't have to do it all myself. It would be really nice at the moment. Um, sorry. Um, but I think it's really cool. So if, if people are interested, I, I'm happy to try, try and extend these. Um, like I think signal processing is a natural one too. Like they've also looked in this area. So. Because I, uh, Akaya, do you have further questions at this? No, no, I'll let somebody else talk. <laughs> sorry. sorry. So I, I don't see any other hands, but I guess I have a couple questions. And also, for those who need to drop off the call, we're at 5.15 now, so feel free to be excused if so. Um, uh, but uh, so quick question. So on your um, SGV results, I remember the in, the results that you had seemed to be like linear convergence to the neighborhood, with a um, exponential that depended only on the minimum um, eigenvalue. Yeah. That's, Can you that's see that you had a table with that? Um, uh, it was easier to sort yeah, of see what. Yeah. Prepare. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm looking at average in the strongly convex case there. Okay. So yeah. So one thing I'm wondering about is like what happens. Like there must be some other dependence on the maximal eigenvalue. Just just in the sense of like if gamma the step size. Because like if I just scale the problem, I can make that lambda minus really big. Yeah, I don't know if did I write this. I apologize. I didn't put it in here because I, I I did. So I always have to assume that my step size is bounded by by this quantity. Um, what this quantity translates to is is one over the trace essentially. <laughs> it's a trace condition. So it's a little bit bigger than the smallest eigen the, the largest eigenvalue. Uh, you get a trace type condition, which is closer to what you see in in. Uh, it, it's very similar to gradient descent. Actually, it's the same type of tree. Like the optimum in gradient descent is like two over mu plus L or something, right? Um, this is mm -hmm. the equivalent of that for SGD. Um, yeah, so you, you actually get better. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say, can we, with that knowledge, can we look at the table? Yeah. I'm curious yeah. about what the improvement was. Okay, so interesting. So it's like 
on one hand, you have a gamma squared in your first worst case analysis, and here you have a yeah still have the same term. Okay, I see. I see. Yeah. You, you drop that second term and you multiply by this polynomial. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I guess, this is, I, oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, Oh, I was going to say, I guess I just have one technical question. I thought that, yeah, it was just, was, was, was curious about that. The second question I have is more like practice oriented. Like, so you mentioned one thing about like um, improving momentum, like methods uh, by using this to choose step sizes. And I wonder like if you've thought about other things you can do in order to improve algorithms with this insight. Yeah, um, so one of the things that we've been interested in is how do you take this and, and construct a, a different algorithm, like a, a new algorithm, based upon, in some sense, like suppose you a priori just assume that your spectrum for your Hessian is, say, like a marching pasteur or something like that. Well, if you use that knowledge, you can actually drive, sort of work backwards, construct a polynomial, <laughs> Um, which is better, which gives you better average rates. Like you can imagine uh, to, to optimal polynomial, stuff, optimal algorithm. One way of deriving an optimal algorithm is you, you find the optimal polynomial for a given mu and you sort of minimize this side with respect to this polynomial. And there's some conditions on what the polynomial needs to be, but they're the ones that you like, they're, they're like CG conditions. So you need P at zero is equal to one, that kind of condition. Um, and you can do that, construct the algorithm, construct the polynomial and then reconstruct the algorithm from there. Um, and, and what that tells you sort of already, because of orthogonal polynomial theory, uh, first of all, that these that uh, these optimal polynomials have to be orthogonal. That, that comes from uh, orthogonal polynomials. Um, from iterative methods. So you already know that these polynomials are orthogonal and almost all of these orthogonal polynomials are three-term recurrences. So in some sense, they have to, or two-term recurrences. So they have to somehow be a momentum type method with different momentum parameters. You, you get that for free um, just by doing that. Um, so, so, and then you can start to say how close are these to the, to, to what we actually use. Um, and we've done some work in this. I, sorry, I, like I said, I'm actually more behind than anything else <laughs> for getting these things out. Um, what we've done a little bit is um, I've constructed sort of the optimal polynomials for like the convex case, like I was saying about Nesterov, and you can actually see that you can actually get a little bit better. Um, so that's kind of cool, <laughs> uh, at least in average. I don't know how it translates into Really, I haven't done the experiments yet to, to make it work, to see like, oh, if I don't do it on a, on a least squares problem, what happens? Um, like, does it still work? How well does it work? Do you need to tweak it a little bit? That kind of stuff. Um, I can tell you then the strongly convex, Polyak is basically optimal. Like it is, it's the one which minimizes this polynomial. Like the, the polynomial for Polyak is, it's a, is the polynomial. Strange. <laughs> it's it's me, like the, the convergence rates are worse for Polyak in general than for Nesterov. I, I but it, it is the optimal one, at least for the least yeah. square. Um, That's not right. Okay. Uh, and I'll see if I have. Oh, sorry. Am I going? Yeah. I mean, it. it uh, Nesterov is crazy. Like the convex one, like the polynomial is just absolutely insane. I don't even know. Oh. If, yeah, Polyak, sorry. Heavy ball. Heavy ball. Heavy ball. Yeah. This is heavy ball. Yeah, heavy ball is exact. Heavy ball is the best you can do, basically, is what you will find. Like, you can't get better. Um, like, it really is good. Nesterov is, Nesterov convex seems to not be. Like, you can do better, basically. Um, yeah. Which is kind of cool. Also, I don't know if they, they if he derived it this way. I, I, like you can drive a polynomial and find the polynomial and like talk about it's off. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if he did it this way, but I think it's kind of cool that you can do it this way. Um, so. so I wanted to give the chance if anybody else had any further questions, and then I want to give Courtney a break because she has a meeting coming up at 5.30 with PhD students. So make sure you take a break. <laughs> um, but were there any questions? Um, not from the PhD students meeting. Okay, so I don't see any. Um, 
So how about we thank Courtney again and, uh, you know, for giving a great talk. And I will virtually and actually physically clap my hands. Um, so, uh, so thanks so much for coming and giving this talk. So well, thank we'll talk you again. guys for having me. Yeah, thanks. Looking forward to the next chapter. Okay. <laughs> the manifesto <laughs> that is appearing page by page. Okay, all right, see you later. Bye. Bye.